Good morning, church family, or at this point, I think I say good afternoon. <laughs> we are the Taylors, and we are very excited to have the opportunity to share with you the word today. As was mentioned in our prayer time, I want to especially say thank you to all of you who wore your name tags. I've definitely appreciated the opportunity to know that I could walk up to you and without fear, say your name. And the more I say your name, the more I will learn your name. And so you may actually see name tags at one point in the future. Um, just out of curiosity, though, is there anybody around here who has been here for a while and still learned a new name today? If, if there is, just raise your hand. If you learned a new name today, <laughs> that's okay. You can confess. For those of you who are watching along online, we'd invite you to also sign in. Uh, you obviously don't have a chance to put on a name tag like I have, and I'm going to take it off at this point. But what we'd like you to do is, if possible, join us on Facebook, just check in. You can also find us on Twitter or any of those other means, and you just put the hashtag, if you're on Twitter, PPAC, Pop Adventist Church, put a hashtag in there, and just say that you're watching us on the stream, and sign in with your own little digital name tag, we'd appreciate that. As we mentioned today, it's not a normal message. <laughs> Normally, I love to get up, how many of you were here when I preached on the book of Jonah a few months ago? I love to take a passage and break it down and see the story that is told by the Bible writers. But today is not a normal message because there's not one preacher today but two. I have my wife, Andrea. You're going to hear our experience. We've long learned in ministry this little saying, behind every face there's a story. I look out and I see a sea of faces. But I know that behind every face, there's a story. And so what we'd like to do for our very first message here, officially, is to share our story. So that you know where we came from that brought us here today to the Paul Paul Adventist Church. I do have a disclaimer, though. <laughs> we do have a disclaimer. That warning. Results may vary. Side effects may include tears, sadness, anger, loss of money, time, or even faith. Please consult with the great physician before beginning this process. Andrea is going to have her opening prayer, and we'll share with you our story. Let us pray. Father God, it's a privilege to come before you this morning to worship you in your sanctuary. We know that this time is a time to draw closer to you, and I just ask you right now that you will send the Holy Spirit to speak through Mike and I, that this congregation may learn the mighty work that you have done in our lives. God, please be with us now. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. So, a little about me. Michael Timothy Taylor, born in 1984. For those of you who do the math, you're probably hating me right now. <laughs> But don't worry, I am slowly catching up with a few of you. I, I call this one here the mortgage process, and I call this gray here the uh, Hebrew in the seminary. Uh, I may be 28, but I have the gray hair of some, quickly coming on the gray hair of somebody who's at least 30. Anyway, <laughs> I was born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. I have two wonderful parents. They are still married, happily married for some 36 years now, uh, Tim and Kim Taylor. Uh, my mom was raised as a Catholic, a uh, very strong Catholic family. My dad was raised as a part of a, the Church of Christ. His uh, parents were members of the Church of Christ all of their lives. And for a long time, uh, unfortunately, my dad grew antagonistic towards what he heard growing up. How many of you can relate to a message of a God that expects perfection? And when you fail to live up to perfect standards, he's waiting to get you. Sure. My dad grew up with this understanding of a God who is out to get him, that the hellfire is just waiting with his name on it. And eventually he got to a point where my dad said, you know what? If God is that angry and that vengeful, I don't want anything to do with him. And so when my parents got together, the family that I grew up in, Faith was not always the most important thing. We would pray the token prayer before the average meal. I didn't realize that that prayer had words until I was about eight because I just kind of mumbled it. It didn't mean anything to me. We would go to church on occasion. I would stay with my aunt, for example. She was, she's a faithful Catholic. I would go to church with her. And uh, 
never really a big fan of, of that worship service. Uh, it was a little bit too formal for me. Uh, I didn't understand the sit, stand, sit, kneel, stand, sit, you know, the, the calisthenics they do to kind of keep you awake and on your toes. I didn't understand that. And so I grew up fairly antagonistic towards Christianity, not just apathetic, but antagonistic. I actually got to a point where I would see all of these so-called Christians in my life. All of the people who claimed to be Christians would go to church faithfully. And as soon as they'd leave church, they'd go back to living like the world. They would hear a message Sunday morning, and by Sunday afternoon, they were breaking every single one of the words that Jesus said. And so to me, I thought, if Christians don't even take this message seriously, why should I? At the same time, I was also a computer geek. From the time I was like a third grader, I was already programming computers. My dad taught me on a Commodore 64 how to program computers. By the time I was the fifth grader in my elementary school, they were pulling me out of my classes to go help the other teachers when their computers would break down. I know. <laughs> so I got into math and science big time. By the time I hit my senior year of high school, I already had eight and a half years worth of math credits. I had already finished four, uh, four semesters of algebra, four semesters of geometry, and yeah, four semesters, which means I get into the crazy non-Euclidean geometry for those of you who are math people. Uh, I've done, I'd done calculus, astrophysics, statistics, uh, everything that Lansing, Community, or Lansing School District had to offer by my senior year, no math. I was a science award winner in my high school. I was self-professed Darwin Jr., it was my job to seek out the foolish Christians who actually believed in those fairy, table, fairy tales and fables. It was my job to rub it in a little bit. To give them a hard time, I actually made more than one Christian cry more than once. I had a computer science engineering scholarship to Michigan State, all planned and ready to go. And I was looking forward to being... My life dream was to work at Nintendo. I had it all figured out. The closest thing I ever had to faith was my senior year of high school, the senior class musical, the spring musical, was Fiddler on the Roof. Anybody ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? Fiddler on the Roof is the story of a Jewish community in Russia. And we were that Jewish community going through the persecution. And they thought it'd be fun, just fun, to cast me when I tried out. I, I was a member of the thespian cl uh, club in my school. They cast me the school atheist and persecutor of Christians, as the rabbi. <laughs> and so, yes, my very first time keeping the Sabbath ev ever, I was an atheist rabbi. <laughs> and uh, I actually have a hat. You may see me in the hat at some point down the road, but it's packed in a box in our garage right now. And so I thought I had my life all figured out. By the time I graduated high school, life was going good for me. And then, God struck. This is where I'll take over and kind of give you an idea of who I am and where I've come from and kind of lead you up to the point where Mike left off. Um, I was raised in a wonderful home, um, although at times it was, it was very tough because my father passed away when I was two years old. And, you know, I got up here and I didn't think it'd be this hard, but it is hard. And I'm sorry. You brought tissues. I'm okay. You're okay. But anyways, God is so good, and he's done so much for us, and that's why we're here to share this today. So I um, mm -hmm. was raised in a wonderful home. My mom um, was a godly woman, and she still is. I'm so thankful for her. When she decided to be baptized, the day she decided to be baptized, I was like six months old. And she was so excited, she decided to come home and tell my dad this great news. And she's like, I'm going to tell him I'm going to be baptized, give my life to the Lord. And that was actually the day he never came home. So my father had a construction accident where he fell from the second floor of a building to the basement. He was in a coma for two years, and I have no memory of him. The 
So for me, growing up, our faith was everything. My mother encouraged me to stay very close to God, to see him as my father. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I, I kind of remembered back to um, the verses that pulled me through this hard time. And in Psalm 68, verse 5, it says, God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows. In Psalm 10, verse 4, it says, he is the helper of the fatherless. And I clung to these promises growing up. And in, in my teenage years, <laughs> if you have a teenager, you understand how difficult that can be. I teach teenagers, and it's sometimes oh, overwhelming, <laughs> but still a blessing. Um, my teenage years were rough. I, I really, really struggled, and I always asked myself, why did my dad have to die? Why was it my father? Why couldn't it have been so, just some drunk on the, you know, off the streets or something who, who could have died? Why my dad? Oh, thank you. And um, so I clung, to, I clung to God. He became my father. And um, fathers here, make sure you love your children because you don't know when your time with them may be over. And fathers, encourage your children to make the best decisions, especially when it comes to choosing the person that God has created for them. My mom always said, set your standards high. Don't ever let them down. So I thought to myself, all right, I will look for a man who, um, you know, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, and has really, really good high standards. Um, I went to a public high school, and in a public high school, you don't find those values. And I looked. I looked all over. And it was in my junior year when I finally got to a point, I was like, God, what are you doing? You know, all my friends have significant others, and here I am, single. And I'm like, what am I going to do? God, where are you? Why haven't you answered my prayer to show me who it is that you want me to be with? And it got to a point where I just... I kind of gave up, and I was like, but Lord, I still trust in you. I know that you will see me through this. And that was around June when God answered my prayers. My life changed forever on June 24th, 2002, when I was actually volunteered to host a birthday pool party for an acquaintance of mine. And Mike will explain a little bit more on this. Well, it wasn't just... Acquaintance. Yeah. To her, it was an acquaintance. Obviously, you all have your groups and cliques in high school. And she was kind of on the outskirts of this group of friends. Well, it just so happened that this group of friends, the birthday girl, was also my ex-girlfriend. And so I had been invited to a birthday pool party for my ex-girlfriend. I didn't want to go. I was ready to have nothing to do with this group of people. But there was another person in the group, a Muslim. It's amazing that we can get up here and tell you that even Muslims can be a part of God's plan. This Muslim said, hey, why don't you come hang out with me? I don't have any, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to come and, you know, if something happens, if you're not comfortable there, just hang out with me. It'll be okay. And I said, okay, that's fine. I went to the pool party and they disappeared. They were gone. I'm like, great. I'm stranded. I'm alone. I've got this ex-girlfriend. I'm trying to avoid her the best I can. And I notice that there is a, I'm a teenage boy. There is a tall, blonde, in a swimsuit, and I'm a teenage boy, and so I went over to her. <laughs> she wasn't talking to anybody, I wasn't talking to anybody, and so maybe we figured, I figured we shouldn't talk to anybody with each other. And so I went over and started talking to her. I think the first words I ever said to you was, uh, the volleyball went over the fence. Yeah, yeah, it was. And a little bit later on, I came over and I started talking to you because I noticed you were still alone and I was still alone and so I figured, let's be alone together. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but not alone together. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we started talking, we started sharing. Like I said, I was tired of the Christians who said they were Christians but did unchristian things because I, as an atheist, had developed a strong sense of moral standards. In my life, I look around and I had seen the results of premarital sex, of drinking, of smoking, of drugs. I'd seen it in my own family, the consequences. Mm -hmm. Some of the dumb choices that were made and then the life-changing consequences. And I made a decision very early on in life that I didn't want that to be me. 
And so even as an atheist, I had high moral standards, and I didn't want a girl who was going to try to pressure me to break my standards. And so imagine my surprise when I meet a young lady who actually has my high moral standards too. And so we start talking. She's beautiful. And she's got my standards. And so we, the natural question came up from her. So you've got all these great standards. Where do you go to church? <laughs> church? Are you serious? You're too smart for something like that, aren't you? you? You know better than all of this. How could you believe in a church? She ruined it for me. It crushed me at that point in time, too, because going to a public high school, I'm like, okay, God, you know, I want to find someone with good standards. I can't find him in a public high school. And then I meet him, and he's perfect. He's made, meeting every single one of my standards except one, and that was God. And it's the highest standard it's for you. The highest, it was the highest standard. So those of you who are looking for significant others, put God on the top of that list. Don't settle. And so we <laughs> talked. I actually stayed at that party later than the birthday girl did. Yep. And, uh, and we, shared, we shared phone numbers. This is before text messaging. So we also shared AOL instant messenger screen names. Yeah. And, uh, anybody I was a spiffy swimmer. <laughs> yeah, you were a spiffy swimmer. She's a swimmer for uh, all of her life up until, what, six shoulder operations? No. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and so we shared, um, you know, we shared phone numbers. And I went home excited because I maybe had a young lady that... Uh, I, I wouldn't mind being seen in public with. And I, had, he left and I was so confused. It's like, God, how could you do this? You know, I've been praying to you for a significant other, you know. And then you give me him? <laughs> I was like, you give me everything I want except the biggest thing, the, my biggest standard. So I went to bed that night and I was kind of, you know, butterflies in my stomach. I was like, oh, he's so nice. But, oh, he doesn't believe in God. So I, um... Woke up the next morning, and I talked to my mom about it. And I said, Mom, you know, you know, I've been really struggling with this, and I've, I don't know what to do, but I met this guy. He's got great standards, and he meets everything that I'm looking for, except he doesn't believe in God. And I didn't know this at the time, but she had actually met him before the party started and before he came in. And she was actually really, really impressed with him. She really liked him, just right from the get-go. And she said, obviously, these standards that he has... And these convictions that he has, they come from somewhere. They don't just appear. And she said, you need to pray about it. You need to talk to God. And that's exactly what I did. With her guidance and with the Holy Spirit's guidance, I decided to date him. And it wasn't easy when we dated. No. I have to admit. It wasn't easy when we dated. The atheist Adventist connection was a little difficult to get used to. First, I'd never heard of Seventh-day Adventist before. And so when we're teenagers and we start dating and I said, hey, let's go out to a movie. When do the best movies come out, by the way? All the good movies come out on Friday. And so I had to see the movie on Friday before my friends at work would spoil it for me over the weekend. And so, come on, Friday night, let's go out. We got to see this new movie. We got to see the sequel to, I don't know, something. And uh, I, I, come on, let's go out Friday night. Jesus asked me not to. Wait, you actually take him seriously? Yeah. Okay. Well, fine. We won't go out. But we'll go back to you. We'll go back. I'll go over to your place. We'll watch the movies there. We'll watch some TV. I'll grab a couple pepperoni pizzas on my way. We'll have a good time. Jesus asked me not to. Not to what? Eat pork, and I need to. I want to keep the Sabbath. What? What cult do you belong to? <laughs> It was hard for us because she stood up for her moral convictions. My mom always encouraged me to do that. Yep. And to me, that was actually a very strong thing because I'd never had a Christian stand up for their faith before. And so we dated and we broke up. And we dated and we broke up. And we didn't officially date, but we hung out together. I brought her flowers. Yeah, and he'd take me out to eat, and I guess I let him. <laughs> He was still really nice, and I, uh, my heart was still drawn to him. But still in my heart, God was saying, you can't, you can't let this go. You have to stand up for what you believe in. And so we broke up. Um, that was hard. After about six months of dating, we, we separated. We separated. That was in January. Um, January was a rough month for me. That was, it was, oh boy, 
I don't know how many years it was since my dad passed away. He, was, he died on January 21st, so. It was uh, 2003, so it would have been like the 15th anniversary. 15th year, and you know, I, I was a wreck. <laughs> but um, we broke up and we parted ways. We didn't see each other for about six months. That was my senior year of high school, and I was graduating. This was around June when I graduated, and I got a phone call. And at this point in time, I was thinking, oh boy, I don't know who this is. And I picked up, and it's Mike. And I'm like, oh no. You know, the whole time that we had been separated, I had been praying for him, that he would be in the kingdom. I was done with him, with the relationship. I was actually looking to try and date someone else. And here he came again, and I was like, oh great, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> And so the reason that I called her that day was because the whole time we were separated, little reminders of my time with her kept coming up. I have to admit, I am the son of the world's pickiest eater. Mm -hmm. You'll probably see this at Potluck. I am still a recovering son of the world's pickiest eater. Before I met her, I had never eaten salad. Yeah, I had never been to Taco Bell because I wasn't sure what was in the meat. I, uh, just a number of things. And she... She broke me in on a few of those things. And so as time went on, I, uh, uh, you know, I'd see these reminders, and, and just this voice starts coming into my head. Time with her really wasn't that bad, was it? I mean, that, that Christian thing wasn't that big of a roadblock, was it? And so I heard this voice in my head saying, you know what? Why don't you give her another shot? And so I made he the decision. Called, he called and just said he wanted to take me out for a graduation gift. I didn't know he still had these feelings going on. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I called and I asked her out. And uh, we went out and we got the graduation gift. And I think I took you out for dinner that night as well. Grab, Probably. Just to grab a bite to eat. Oh, come on. It's dinner time. Let's just get something. Yeah. And I think I took you out for dinner a few more times during that week. Yeah. And he kept coming back. And I was like, no, Lord, I'm done with him. I don't want to go through this again because I know he's such an atheist. He's so strong in these convictions that he doesn't, he won't budge. I know this, but I still kept praying. I was like, Lord, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do, but I'll just, I'll keep trusting in you. You've gotten me through so much in my teenage years and in my childhood. I know that he would see me through this as well. So there was one afternoon, I think it was, or one evening, it was in July, late, late, July, late July. I actually prayed and I said, God, these feelings for Mike are really coming back, and they're coming back even stronger. I was like, you have got to give me a sign. If he is supposed to be in my life, you have to make it so crystal clear that I understand it. Because right now, he is show showing no signs of changing. So I prayed that prayer, and it's amazing. When, when you ask, God answers. Not, it wasn't more than two hours later that Mike came over and said, I want to read the Bible. And I was thinking, <gasps> The angels were like singing in my head at that point in time. I was like, yes, this is my answer to prayer. And I, know. I, I still saw it as a coincidence because He's, let me tell you where I was coming from and why I made this decision. And then we'll, I'll let Andrea keep going here. I was an atheist. All of us atheists know that the Bible is full of contradictions, errors, mistakes. There are things in the Bible that are scientifically impossible. And so I made the decision. I'd read through some Greek literature in high school and Roman literature. I'd read the mythologies before and analyzed them and figured out the problems. And so I made the decision, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give it a shot. I'm just going to read the Bible and I'm going to find these problems and I will check it off my list and we will consider it done for. But there was something else in my mind that really was prompting me to, give the, to, to even consider this in the first place. I heard this voice. It's that same voice who was saying, life with her wasn't that bad. Why don't you reach out to her again? And now this voice is saying to me, you know, she's important to you. And that book, that book is important to her. So why don't you pick it up? Just read it. Go ahead. Just give it a shot. And so I heard this voice in my head and I said, you know, that's not too bad of an idea. I'm going to give it a shot. I want to read the Bible. And yeah. it just so happened coincidentally that it was two hours. It wasn't coincidence. <laughs> two hours later, I was at her door saying, I want to read the Bible. And all, uh, again, all heaven was singing because that was my sign. Um, I went home that night. Yeah. The first thing I did insist on, and for those of you who uh, 
ask about Bible translations, the first thing I insisted on is not a King James Version, just because I wanted to read something that's written in English. And so the first translation, if you read the, the King James Version, great. Praise the Lord. Whatever Bible translation you use to draw closer to Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. The one that brought me that I went home with that night was the New Century Version, because it's written for a third grade reading level. I'm 20. It was perfect for me. And so I went home. I started in the beginning. And I, I started in Genesis, and I started to realize that maybe there weren't as many complications as I thought there were going to be. But more than that, I also saw, saw some things in there that science would never be able to answer for me. I started to see, for example, a guiding hand behind some things that had been considered miraculous. For example, what caused the Big Bang? For me, the, the, if Big Bang is absolute, it, science has no, question, or no answer at this point definitively what caused the Big Bang. And when I saw Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it all of a sudden flipped the switch of, maybe that's what it was. And so uh, I, I would say that I began the process of becoming a theistic evolutionist. The idea of still billions of years, but in the beginning God. And I also started reading through, I started to sense a, a, a purpose. I always wrestled with this question, and it's funny, I never hear Christians ask this question, what's the meaning of life? You ever hear people ask the question, what's the meaning of life? I never hear Christians ask that question because the meaning of life is not a what, it's a who. Mm -hmm. But it, for me, I was wrestled with the meaning of life. When I was a teenager, I wrestled with why am I wasting this world's time if I'm just an accident and a coincidence? And I come and I go and I'm out of here and I mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. Why am I wasting this world's time? I battled with depression on and off. I battled with suicidal thoughts on and off. And... Um, in the Bible, I found purpose. I also found something significant as I started to read through the stories, the great stories of the patriarchs. Noah, he's a great man, right? God called him out because of his righteousness. Build the ark for me. Save the world because of your righteousness, it says in Genesis chapter 6. But what happened when Noah left the boat? Did he stay faithful to God? He planted a vineyard. He got in the uh, bottle just a little bit. He fell from God. But did God give up on him? Did God cast him away? No. And then I read about Abraham, that great man of faith, who just about every chapter expressed significant unfaith. He had a child with his wife's secretary, effectively. He lied about his wife all the time. And yet he was God's chosen man, the father of the nations. Moses murdered a man. David. Oh, don't get me started on David. And yet the whole way through, God was patient and loving with these mistake-ridden Christians, pre-Christians. And so it started to it's, uh, say into my mind as I'm reading through the Bible, if God's that patient with Christians who make mistakes, maybe I should be too. And so I made the decision... I think I'm ready to go to church for the first time. That was on September 6, 2003. How do you know that date? Because that's my mom and stepdad's anniversary. Um, <laughs> my mom remarried in 2003 to a godly man, um, and he's a blessing in my life, and I know he is in Mike's as well. Amen. And my mom and stepdad at that time invited him and said, hey, why don't you come to our wedding? Our wedding is actually going to be during church service. It was a little different, but it was really, really special. They got married in church service, and Mike was like, you know, I, I think I'll go to that. It's the least I could do. It's the least I could do, you know. My, my girlfriend's mom is getting married, so he came to church for the first time in how many years? Uh, voluntarily, my entire life. Voluntarily came to church. And um, he sat through the sermon very patiently. Um, the normal pastor wasn't there, so it was a, an older elder. It was the person that had been studying with them. Yes. It, was, it was the other pastor at the time who had been studying with them. And Mike didn't find him as interesting as other pastors. The word was boring. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. So um, I always I said to him, you know what, it's okay, come back next week, because the youth pastor will be, will be preaching. And he, he relates better to youth. So he actually came back the next week. I came back the next week. Uh, the, the pastor who was preaching at the time, is, she said youth pastor, oh, and it was actually the pastor. senior pastor who has an emphasis on youth. Yeah. And, and that was sort of the model that I've now taken up, is this idea of the pastor 
who is in charge of the congregation, but his focus is working with the youth because the youth aren't just the future of our church, the youth are the present of our church. And so, uh, has anybody ever heard of Steve Yeagley down at Andrews University? His brother David was the pastor of the Lansing Church before moving out to Washington to be the youth director. And it was David Yeagley who was preaching at that time, and he's preaching a series that was completely relevant to youth life and issues. And so I started to come to church several times over the uh, next several weeks. I still had to work on Sabbaths, and so if I was free in the mornings, I would come to, uh, I would come to church. And something changed over the next several months as I realized that I'd stopped at one point going to church for her, and I'd started to come for me. I realized as Andrea was homesick one day, and I still showed up to church, and I'm sitting through church, and about 20 minutes in, I'm like, why am I here? Andrea's not here. But I didn't get up and go, because I realized I wanted to be there. And so I made the decision that I wanted to be baptized. I wanted to do Bible studies. I started studying with Pastor Yeagley. Oh, the thing that really pushed me over the edge was the same year, this was 2004. Has anybody ever seen The Passion of the Christ? It is a brutal, violent movie, R-rated for a reason. We actually don't own it. But at that movie, I watched what Jesus went through for me. Doing my Bible reading, I had just hit the New Testament. I was cool with the Old Testament. Everything about the Old Testament made sense. And I expected to open my Bible to the first book. I see the New Testament of Jesus Christ, and I expected to open it up and to be the first verse says, now everything you just read doesn't count anymore. Everything you just read, it's out. Jesus is new. We're starting fresh. And I didn't find that. I found Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I'm like, genealogy? I slept through a genealogy in Chronicles. I know genealogies. And I know Abraham. I know David. And so Jesus to me, was a continuation of everything that I'd seen, a fulfillment of everything I'd seen before. And then when I saw it, the passion of the Christ, I said, that's my Jesus. Mm. That's the one that I need. He's the one in my life. I couldn't do this without him. And so I made the decision. I started doing Bible studies. I wasn't the most faithful at doing my homework. It's okay, kids, if you make mistakes when you're doing your homework, when you're studying with me. I wasn't perfect either. And I started reading. I started studying. And I was baptized December 18th, 2004. But that wasn't the only big thing that happened in December, in the fall of 2004, was it? Nope. On November 24th, we got engaged. Yeah. And then a month later, he was baptized. Excuse me. There were other big things going on at that point in time as well. I was in my second year of college working on a degree in architecture and interior design. I had a scholarship for that. Mike was working on his computer science engineering scholarship. Going to Nintendo. I was still praying on that one. <laughs> and um, we were doing well in our studies, except Mike came to me one day and said, I failed my computer programming class. I'm like, oh, OK. And he was put on academic probation for the scholarship. And basically, it stated that he had to retake the class. And if he passed the class, then he would get a scholarship back. So he's like, all right, I can do this. I studied harder. I worked harder. Just something about computer programming, I didn't understand class objects and vectors. If you know computer programming, class objects and vectors, it's still a mystery to me today. I, I can explain it, I just can't code it. And so I studied. I worked harder. I kept pushing. And I was like, I'm doing better on my homework. I'm doing better on my tests. And I saw it, too. I saw him studying, and he showed me his tests. He's like, look, I'm doing so well. And I'm like, yay! And that I still failed the class at the end of the semester. It is seriously a God thing because I truly don't, I don't, the math doesn't make sense to me, but he failed it. And there went his computer science engineering scholarship. And so I'm thinking to myself, okay, God, I've given you my life. We're about to start our life together. And now I lose the one thing that I was sure of. What are you doing? What are you doing, God? Where does this sound familiar? What are you doing, God? And so I said, okay, maybe fine, fine, fine. Maybe I'm supposed to take my math and physics education and I'm supposed to be a math or physics teacher because I like teaching. I was good with physics. You'll actually see me use physics in some of my sermon illustrations. How many of you, uh, where's Jesse? Jesse, do you remember when I made a pickle glow like a light bulb a couple years ago? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably do that again for you church members to see. You can make a pickle glow like a light bulb. The answer and how you do it, you just plug it in. There's and you, a little bit more twist. You, you'll now, see me okay. do that later. And so I made the decision, you know what, I'm going to start, I'm going to study on my own. 
And so I took a semester of, of math and physics so I could start to prepare to be a, a science teacher. But I realized that over the course of the next few months, I had some changes to make as well, because I was recently a baptized Seventh-day Adventist. And you, when you wait tables in the restaurant industry, and you can't work on Friday nights, and you can't work on Saturdays, there's your big money. Mm -hmm. I was one of the head servers in the restaurant. I could pick my schedule. I could pick my sections. And when I told my boss for the first time, I can't work on Fridays and Saturdays because Jesus asked me not to, <laughs> they asked you, wait, what? You're, you're kidding, right? You're, you'd rather work on Monday mornings than Friday nights? How are you ever going to pay the bills? And I'm like, that's not for me to decide. That's for him. Yeah. And so we never had a late bill. Through the course of the, the next several weeks, I realized I'm giving more Bible studies than physics lessons. And so I realized maybe I am called to be a teacher, but a teacher of his word. I'm supposed to be a pastor. I felt this calling in my mind after lots of prayer. And so I made the decision one day, I was going to tell Andrea, I, I felt the clear conviction that I am supposed to be a pastor. And on that day, I don't remember what day it was, but it the, the day prior to that, I had really done some soul searching as well. I was praying to God saying, we're giving you our lives. Mike has just been baptized. He's, we're going to start our lives together. What are you doing again? And it's amazing when you think everything is lost and when you feel like you're weak and you don't know what to do, that's when God is the strongest. And so I was praying one night. And I said, God, what are you going to do, do for us? And God spoke to me and said, Mike is to be a pastor. And I was like, oh, great, I have an answer. This is another one of those give me a sign thing. So I go to Mike and I was like, I have great news. I got to tell you this. I have to tell you this. And you I, I, I've got to go first. I think I'm supposed to be a pastor. And I looked at him and I said, I was going to tell you that exact same thing. So God called us both into this ministry. Amen. Um, there were clear cut signs. So we're thinking, all right, well, if he wants to be a pastor, he has to go to Andrews University to get his training. And we're thinking, all right, God will give us another sign, just like, you know, maybe a postcard in the mail. The back maybe of the Lake someone, Union Herald, something like yeah, that. Yeah, maybe someone will get up at church and announce that, hey, you know, come to Andrews, we're having a preview day or something. And we got a sign that we never, ever expected. I'm waiting tables at the restaurant still. I'm waiting tables at the buffet. It's a sister of Ryan's, if you've ever heard of Fire Mountain. I'm waiting tables at a buffet. And one day I'm at work, and I run across this gentleman. His name is Leland McElmory. Leland McElmory, uh, just so you know the Kalamazoo connection, this is um, Estelle Boyce's brother. brother from the Nichols Road Church. Leland is all over the history of the Lansing Church. I was the web designer for the Lansing Church's website, and I was going through the history, and I found that he had donated the land that the church was, was built on. He donated the organ. He donated the communion table. Um, Karen and his Jeff still back there. Uh, if you've been in N235, there's a plaque on the wall. If you've ever read the plaque, it says, we want to thank Leland McElmory for his generous donation that made the seminary uh, renovation possible. This guy is like, he was the head of Sparrow Hospital, the chief of medicine for Sparrow Hospital. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, what in the world are you doing here? That's a buffet. You could buy this place. You could do so much better than this. And so I walk up, hey, how's it going? What are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm just having lunch with a friend of mine. Here, let me introduce you. And he takes me over to his table, and it's another elderly gentleman. He says, oh, this is my friend. We've been friends for all of our lives. This is uh, Dr. Niels Eric Andreasen. <laughs> for those of you who are laughing, why, why is it so funny? <laughs> who is Niels Eric Andreasen? <laughs> President of Andrews University. So Mike gets on the phone immediately and calls me and was like, you'll never guess who I just met. And I was like, oh, maybe a senator, maybe the governor, maybe someone really important. With, I'd seen all sorts of famous people. I'd seen the governor. Magic Johnson's dad was one of my regulars in the restaurant. So I'd seen famous people before. And I was thinking, OK, who is this? Who'd you meet? Did you get their autograph? You know, How cool would that be? And then he tells me, I met the president of Andrews University. And my head just dropped. Because at this point in time, yes, I believe that God called us into ministry, but I hadn't really taken it to heart. And I didn't actually believe it was going to happen until that happened, <laughs> until we met, he met the president of Andrews. And within two weeks, we had all of the information that we needed to get registered for classes, to set up the financial things. We had toured the campus. We had gotten our housing situation figured out. 
And within, I think it was nine, ten months? We were studying down at Andrews. We were studying down at Andrews. We had left everything behind. We were big city people moving down to that <laughs> yeah. sprawling metropolis of Berrien Springs. It was like, it's kind of funny. We were sleeping one night. I think it was the first, first night. First we night there. And we're like, oh, it's really hot in here. So we opened up the windows and. We didn't hear the highway. We didn't we lived hear right the. right next to the highway in Lansing. No police sirens. We're like, oh, it's so peaceful and quiet. And I was like, hey, Mike. You can, you can hear the bugs. And then we're like. Those sound like big bugs. We're like, wait, close the window, close the window. <laughs> so we've had some good times, and God saw us through three years down at Andrews. And um, I gave up my architecture and interior design scholarship to become a teacher. My mom had done daycare all throughout my childhood. So I was constantly exposed to children, and I, I loved them. I had so much fun. I'd play school with them. And my mom would always say, you know, maybe you should be a teacher. And I was like, no way that can't be me I can't do that and I said I just want to do you know architecture interior design and I finally submitted to what God had always called me to do and that was to go into teaching and I don't regret it for a minute I love my job I love my students and it is a blessing amen amen and uh, we had the privilege I, I do have to share this with you we were married by, uh, because Pastor Yeagley had just left, and so Pastor Quentin Purvis hadn't left Kalamazoo yet to go to Lansing. And so we talked to Andrea's um, teacher. youth teacher and asked if she and her husband could do our premarital counseling and could marry us. And so Elder Royce Naiman was the pastor who married Andrea and I back in July of 2005. And we also had the privilege when we were graduating from Andrews University just a few months before, Royce called and said, hey, we need to have dinner with you. And so we got together for dinner, and he says, Michigan would like to ask you and Andrea if you would be willing to work for the Michigan Conference. They hired us, um, sent us up to Grand Rapids. I spent a year in Grand Rapids doing ministry. Oh, this is something else crazy, is they made the decision. Ministerial hired me, like, months before graduation. Education had already put a word in that they wanted to hire her, like, a year and a half before. She met Linda Fuchs, like, a year and a half before. And so... Ministerial all of a sudden was like, oh yeah, we want to hire you too. And so they place me almost immediately and say, we know that we're going to send you to Grand Rapids Central. And then we said, okay, great. So where's Andrea going to teach? Is there a school up there? And they said, there is a school, but there's no openings. And I was like, no, huh? I'm supposed to teach. What are you doing, God? Again, when you are weak, God is strong. And so we set our moving date. We're just going forward. It was we're, April 29th. We're waiting it. to see what God has in store for us next, and especially waiting to see what happens to Andrea. And just days before moving day, Andrea gets a call. And they say, we'd like to have you interview at Kalamazoo Junior Academy. And I was like, oh, okay, great. Are, am I going to be teaching like kindergarten, first grade? Because that's really what I wanted to do. And they're like, no, you're going to be interviewing for a grade seven to nine. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> It's like, this is not what I want to do. Jeez. And they said, oh, and by the way, the interview is on April 29th at 8 o'clock. And I was like, that's our PM. moving day. PM. I was like, oh, okay. So we move up to Grand Rapids. We unpack everything. Third floor and, apartment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we get down to Kalamazoo. We have the interview. I was grilled for like two hours of questions. And... Um, on our way back home to we, Grand Rapids. We didn't even make it back on the highway. We were barely back on 131. And they had called to offer me the position. Yeah. And so I, oh, so, re I don't want to say reluctantly accepted, but I was kind of hesitant. I'm like, oh, could teaching grades 7, 8, 9? No, that's not what I want to do. Those kids changed your mind, didn't they? Oh, I wouldn't leave them for anything. I, I love my teenagers. And so part of the reason that we are here at Paw Paw is because Andrea is still teaching at Kalamazoo. I am now in my third pastoral district since they placed Andrea at Kalamazoo. I'd been in Grand Rapids and in Kalamazoo and now here at Paw Paw. Uh, we're very excited about these opportunities. We are looking forward to, now that we've shared a little bit of our story, to get to learn your stories as time goes on. I do want to do one thing. I do see that, that you have back here an altar Bible. Altar Bibles are very important things. I've learned something over the years, though. One of the things that I've heard from Dr. Raymond Holmes, did you know that the Adventist Church has an official Bible verse for these altar Bibles? They're not supposed to be opened randomly. Does anybody know what the verse that we are supposed to represent as Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to be? Anybody want to take a guess? Raise your hand. Anybody want to take a guess? What, what would you guess is the Bible verse that we're supposed to be open to? 
You're guessing in Romans. Anybody else want to take a guess? Sabbath, the, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, it's a good guess. Revelation 14, the three angels' message, another good guess. Uh, John 3.16 is another popular one. But what I want to do is I've learned this through my journey, and especially as I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I couldn't have done it. I wouldn't be here without the Bible. Amen. And so I open this altar Bible to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, which reads, to the law and to the testimony, to the Bible, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I stand before you as a pastor who didn't grow up in the Adventist church. I don't know what the traditions are. I don't know what we're supposed to be doing all the time. I didn't even realize until a couple of years that the camp meeting wasn't at Camp Asabel because I didn't know. All I know to what, on what to do is what this word teaches. Amen. And so I'm not afraid to break traditions to stand up for his word. Amen. But I want you to hold me to his word. Amen. The next thing I do want to remind you of was our scripture reading. This is my favorite verse. I want to read it from the message. Paul writes, Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. God has done miraculous things in our lives. And as we were thinking of our testimony and what God has done for us, there have been so many miracles and so many signs. And we've come up with some, I don't know, little things to remember. Be kind to each other. Be kind to even the people who aren't Christians. Because you never know what impact you're going to have on their lives. I never thought... Keep on. I, I, when I met Michael, that he would give his life to Christ. I never thought he would even beca become a pastor. That, ugh, that was the last thing I ever thought of. Never stop praying for your loved ones because you never know what impact you're going to have. During the time when we had broken up for six months, again, I was praying for him, not that we would get back together, but I was praying that I would see him in the kingdom because that was most important to me. So th the friends that you have that aren't Christian, Pray for them. Don't stop praying. And uh, may I just add, you, did you quit praying for me as soon as I came, said I wanted Absolutely to? Absolutely not. Continue praying for them, even when they do make that decision to follow Christ. Keep praying for them, for them because that's when Satan really turns up the heat and yeah. really tries to discourage them. Yeah. You had your moments. <laughs> so, And the other thing we've learned is that um, in our ministry in Kalamazoo, we had our times where it got to be really tough, really, really tough for Mike to say, I, I, don't, I don't think I can continue with this. And I looked at him and I said, if you choose to walk away from the ministry, you are denying everything that God has already done for us. And we've learned that God puts you through these trials and through these situations for a reason, to build your faith for later times. Because when you're discouraged and when you're weak, look back on those trials look back at them and say, I'm thankful for them because you'll see how God has still worked in the past. When your faith seems weak, remember those times all the more. Yeah. And you want uh, just a closing story to transition into our closing song, which isn't in the bulletin, but our closing song will be number 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And the reason we pick this song is because of the story in Joshua chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And the people began afresh started anew going into the promised land with a new leader. Mm -hmm. With a new leader, one of the things that they did was that they left stones, rocks of remembrance. Mm -hmm. These were Ebenezer's. Yep. They could look back on these stones and to remind, them, remind themselves and remind each other of what they'd been through mm -hmm. and how God had led them in the past. And so we share this with you. These are our Ebenezer's. 
our Rocks Remembrance, the story that we've been through. There are many more stories too, <laughs> too many to mention. And so that's why we like this song. In the second verse, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. God puts us through these trials so we can be home together one day. The closing hymn, I'd invite you to grab a hymnal, number 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. If you'd like to sing that along with us, please stand and let us sing our closing song.